So I'm going to give you an overview of the normal anatomy of the outflow tracts, and throughout the presentation, I will actually um, share with you why this view is important and what could you make a diagnosis if the view is not so. Same disclosures uh, as I highlighted yesterday. So if you look at the blood flow coming through the mitral valve, the blood flow comes out of the aorta, as you see right here, with the direction of blood flow towards the fetal right shoulder. And the blood that comes through the tricuspid valve comes out of the pulmonary artery with the direction of blood flow towards the left shoulder. And that's really important. You see the orientation of the great vessels as they come out of the heart are perpendicular to each other. And here you see in this clip, the aorta is posterior to the pulmonary artery, is angling towards the fetal right shoulder. The pulmonary artery is anterior, is angling towards the fetal left shoulder. So when we talk about the great vessels that are perpendicular to each other, they are perpendicular to each other at the origin from the heart. When you look at later outside, if you look right here at the level of the three vessel trachea view, you see that they are actually parallel to each other. So the concept of the great vessels are perpendicular, they are really perpendicular only when they come out of their respective chambers. If you have parallel orientation of the great vessels as they come out of their respective chambers, as you see in this oblique view, this is typically diagnostic of transposition of the great artery, corrected transposition, or in some double outlet right ventricles. Okay, so that's really why the, the relationship of the great vessels is really Im important. So if you look at the LVOT, the LVOT comes out of the left ventricle as you see right here. So this is inflow into the left ventricle, mitral valve, outflow. Both the mitral and the aortic valve are in the same plane. Unlike on the right side where the tricuspid inflow and the pulmonary inflow are not in the same plane, are actually in a different orientation. But if you look at how the ascending aorta comes out, it makes a slight angle with the ventricular septum as it comes out of the left ventricle. So there is an important anatomic feature, and you could see here on the autopsy specimen also the slight angle that the LVOT makes with the left ventricle. I'll be uh, talking about non-atherosclerotic carotid disorders and imaging of these disorders. So when we're thinking about carotid pathologies, we have to sort of know what atherosclerosis looks like in order to understand what non-atherosclerotic diseases are. And so as Marsha went over before, when we are talking about plaque characterization, we say things are homogeneous or smooth, heterogeneous, irregular calcified plaque. But basically, we see plaque and this is what it looks like. Um, there are high risk features to plaques, as Marsha talked about, and um, these are areas that are heterogeneous with hypoechoic areas that can represent soft plaque. And although um, Marsha said she doesn't like that word ulceration because it's pretty nonspecific, I do think there are some plaques that clearly are ulcerated, particularly ones like this where you can actually see color flow within the plaque itself, and these tend to be higher risk. And so this is the typical appearance of atherosclerotic plaque and atherosclerotic carotid disease. This is uh, images taken from a 90-year-old woman. And we can see on this grayscale cine here that there is heterogeneous, calcified, irregular, shadowing plaque. Um, lesions tend to be at the distal CCA, the origin of the ICA. So as Dr. Pollock was saying, they're bifurcation lesions. We see market velocity elevation at the area of plaque. We see evidence of narrowing at the location, distal CCA, proximal ICA. So when do you suspect non-atherosclerotic causes of carotid artery disease? Well, number one, you have to think about 
the patient who's laying on the bed in front of you? Do they have traditional risk factors, age, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, smoking, et cetera? Is the lesion in the correct location for atherosclerosis? So if you see a lesion that's in the distal ICA, probably not going to be an atherosclerotic lesion. And then also, is the lesion typical appearing? Does it look heterogeneous or hypoechoic or hypoechoic? Does it look like a focal area of plaque? So here's our first case. This is a 38-year-old woman who presents with a cardiac murmur. She is actually referred for cardiac surgery. And at my prior institution, we used to perform carotid ultrasounds on all pre-cardiac surgery patients. Our first clue that this is is that this is a 38-year-old woman. So uh, number one, young age. Number two, young age and a woman. And so probably should be thinking about pathologies other than atherosclerosis. So So now we're going to turn to vertebral ultrasound. Many of the guidelines and the specific points that Leslie Scout pointed out about waveforms and how important they are for anticipating disease somewhere that you cannot directly image become crucial in the vertebral artery. So keep yourself posted for that. This is the outline of my talk. First we'll talk a little bit about in situ, the vertebral artery itself. Then we're going to talk about what happens in the vertebral artery when there are problems elsewhere in the greater great vessel circulation and at places where you are not directly imaging because this is a very important part of the analysis of waveforms in the vertebral artery. And here's our friendly diagram that I'm going to use over and over. I will give credit to a prior resident of mine who had incredible PowerPoint artistic skills who crafted this. I asked, I, I told him what I had in mind and he crafted these beautiful diagrams which I I think will help and impress upon you the things that we're going to see. You know, we don't image much of the vertebral artery when we do our cerebrovascular imaging. You know, we usually sort of look at it in one place, but it's important to know the overall anatomy above and below the level that we're looking for. And so most of the time, the vertebral artery arises from the subclavian artery, but you should know, and we see this all the time on other imaging, it can arise directly from the aortic arch, which could potentially change things that you see. And then it comes up through the spine, as you know, and that's where we image it in between the bones, eventually coming through the foramen magnum, joining, um, it gives rise to pica branches, and then it joins with the contralateral vertebral artery to form the basilar artery. It is this connection above that is so important to what what happens to vertebral artery waveforms when there are problems in the other great vessels. Unlike the carotid circulation, which is pretty much in most people standard and straightforward, unless you know you have disease which has altered it, there is much more variation in the vertebral arteries in size. One is often more dominant than the other. There can be significant hypoplasia, et cetera. And mind you, even though I think there are places where it says that there are no branch vessels of the vertebral artery in the neck, there are all kinds of collaterals around that, that happen. So a lot more variation that has to play into some of, of how definitive we can end up being about some of these diagnoses. So as I mentioned,